I know, it's funny when I got your email last time. Oh, it and got my memories. <laughs> M&Ms now. Oh, peanut m ms that's even more exciting. <laughs> Those are not peanut m ms those are caramel m ms Who knows? I know. Uh, yeah, nothing brings them out like soft story or code adjustments. <laughs> <laughs> uh, margin. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was the 
I would like to call to order the Albany City Council meeting for February 19th, 2019. Uh, please join Council Member Nick Pilch in the Pledge of Allegiance. As is our Council's custom, we use the traditional version omitting the phrase under God. I pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag of the United, United States, States of America and, and to, to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It's getting to feel a little more natural. Okay, go ahead with the roll call. Thank you. Councilmember Barnes? Here. Councilmember Moss? Here. Councilmember Pelch? Here. Vice Mayor McQuay? Here. Mayor Nason? Here. The next item on the agenda is ceremonial matters. Um, a, we have a proclamation for African American History Month. And for this, I'm going to ask uh, Vice Mayor McQuaid and former Mayor Joyce Jackson to join me at the podium. Mayor Joyce Jackson played an important role in Albany's own history. At a very fraught time in this country, she became one of the first African American mayors in California, and there had not yet been a great many in the entire United States. It is important to realize it was also a fraught time in Albany, and Mayor Jackson symbolized not only the changing of the guard politically, she also exercised a remarkably calming and effective leadership style that helped a city wounded in many ways by its history to begin to recover and develop a new way of being a community. City of Albany proclamation in honor of February 2019 as African American History Month. Whereas African American History Month in February celebrates the contributions that African Americans have made and recognizes the achievements and the central role of African Americans in US history. And whereas African American History Month had its origins in 1915 when historian and author Dr. Carter G. Woodson founded the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. And whereas Dr. Woodson initiated the first Negro History week in February 20, 1926, the particular week selected for, for the inclusion of the birthdays of Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass, two key figures in the history of African Americans. And whereas in 1986, Congress passed Public Law 99-244, which designated February 1986 as National Black Afro-American History Month, and whereas President Ronald Reagan declared in 1986, the American experience and character can never be fully grasped until the knowledge of black history assumes its rightful place in our schools and our scholarship, and whereas the, or the 2019 theme is black migrations, which follows the continuous movement of blacks from the American South to the industrialized North and beyond, and whereas Black History Month reminds us of the struggles by African Americans for equal opportunity and freedom from discrimination, which began hundreds of years ago and have not yet ended. And whereas this celebration also acknowledges the important, though often untold, roles and achievements of African, Af that African Americans have played in our history, identity, culture, economy, literature, sports, and politics. And whereas other countries around the world, including Canada and the United Kingdom, also devote a month to celebrating black history. Now therefore, the Albany City Council does hereby proclaim February 2019 as African American History Month in the city of Albany. We acknowledge the contribution of African Americans in our community and recognize that our journey, journey to a full inclusive society is not yet over. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
Mayor Nason and Vice Mayor uh, McQuaid and members of, oh, sorry. Thank you, sorry. Um, I'll start over. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Nason and Vice Mayor McQuaid and members of the um, uh, City Council for your very thoughtful and welcome uh, resolution uh, honoring uh, black history. On behalf of Albany's uh, African American community, as well as individuals of every race who have worked and are continuing to work to contribute to making Albany a better and more welcoming place for all to live, I am honored to accept this resolution. I join with those who recognize that black history is an integral part of every, um, every American's history, and therefore, um, because it is, must be woven into history for all students in order to have a complete and accurate picture of our American history. Finally, if I may digress for a moment, I would like to pay tribute to uh, those African American uh, mayors who served simultaneously uh, in the 1970s. Uh, there was, uh, and he is still living, uh, Nathaniel Bates in Richmond, uh, Warren, the late Warren Widener in Berkeley, uh, and the late uh, Lionel Wilson in Oakland. <clears throat> Again, many thanks uh, to this elected body for this recognition and all good wishes to each of you. Okay, hey, um, no closed session was held today. Uh, so we go directly to the consent calendar. Consent calendar items are considered to be routine by the city council and will be enacted by one motion. By approval of the consent calendar, the staff recommendations will be adopted unless otherwise modified by the city council. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a council member or a member of the audience requests removal of, the item, of an item from the consent calendar. Does any city council member wish to pull an item? Five, four. Five, seven. Okay, five, four, and five, seven. Can we, um, okay, um, do we need a staff report on 5-4? This is advisory, I'm looking at the minutes, that's the wrong spot. I used to do that all the time. <laughs> My apologies. That's because it's on the consent calendar. Okay. I don't seem to have the agenda uh, in my binder. You want to use Okay. Uh, this is council member appointments to advisory bodies, and we are um, being notified of the appointment by council member Moss of Harry Chomsky to the Charter Review Committee. Yeah, and I want to thank um, council member for making his appointment to the Charter Review Committee. Um, in passing the resolution uh, stating that the Charter Review Committee would only meet when needed, uh, I had no idea that uh, we did not have a policy for everybody, every body to form and meet at least once after the two-year appointment period began. Mayor Nason has stated that she would not appoint to the Charter Review Committee. Um, and Council Member Barnes has not appointed yet. Um, if Council Members do not appoint, our policies state that we may appoint as a council. I requested that the mayor add such appointments to this agenda, but she did not agree to that. 
I feel that not allowing the body to form and participate in work plan formation is contrary to the spirit of our advisory bodies. I also feel it's disrespectful to the citizens who applied, expecting that they would be called upon to serve. I feel it would be a stretch and likely impossible to say that we can form such a body at the last minute when we need them to consider a possible charter change. Um, I request that we agendize both the change to our policies, allowing a charter review committee to form in me at least once and review any previous work plans they may have, may have been considering and suggest any new work plans and items to the council. And, uh, and that the, we agendize the um, appointment of the rest of the members of the charter review committee. The council is free to alter their, the charter review committee work plan in any way, I may note. Um, and I, I will leave it there. I think um, you're, you're leaving one crucial point out, uh, Council Member Pilch, which is I said that I would not appoint until after uh, the Council has had an opportunity to meet in closed session with its attorney uh, to discuss the um, allegation that has been made that the city is in violation of the California Voting Rights Act. Uh, and that was a, a meeting to discuss the Charter Review Commission uh, and, its, uh, and its members, uh, the appointment of its membership will occur after the closed session. Uh, thank you, I stand corrected. I, I don't see the two connected, but uh, I stand corrected. Thank you. Okay, five, seven. Wait, before we go there, is there a comment sure. from the council on that? Um, you know, I, I, I have to say that I do agree, at least in principle, with um, Council Member Pilch. The council did um, make a slight change, I think, in the pr meeting procedure for the Charter Review com com Committee to meet upon request of the City Council in advance of an election. Um, and I, I think with that in mind that we should um, not be holding up appointing people at this time. Okay, well, um, at least two of us have not made appointments, and a part of that is when you're recruiting people, there can be a big difference between um, telling them that they're going to be meeting perhaps every month over a two-year period, as opposed to perhaps between one and three meetings in advance of an election. Um, we, I, I also am partially in agreement with Council Member Pilch with regard to this sort of peculiar thing that we have done with the Charter Review Commission. Uh, I don't think we really uh, discussed it, and we need to uh, we need to dive into it a little bit before we decide uh, that we are not going to have people meeting um, until just before the election. Um, but again, I think that it's most appropriate after we have had the opportunity to have the closed session meeting. Uh, I mean, if you're, you're looking for comments, I, I, I think that makes a certain amount of sense. So I, I, I guess we're requesting that perhaps we should agendize something in the future to, to have that discussion. Yeah, that is the plan. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I think that we are ready for a motion. I'd like yeah, five seven sorry. discuss, please. Oh, I apologize. That's okay. Can okay. I also have a uh, five seven? May we have a staff report? Um, perhaps I could just simply ask my question, and it'll save us some time here. Um, it's kind of a question comment, and I, I, I just want to comment on the the paving on Washington between San Pablo and Masonic. Uh, as we know, it's a um, bicycle route, and pavement is, is not in really good condition. So I just want to be sure that there's a coordination here between the um, pavement and the sewer work. And perhaps, Mark, you could address that. Or Robert, or? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the staff uh, in, intentionally put the Washington Avenue sewer rehabil rehabilitation project as part of this scope so that we would expect that it would be done in the springtime. We've, we've coordinated with a contractor and they're willing to put this project, this portion of the scope um, in the front and the front part of their schedule, which will give us room to design and bid uh, Washington Avenue uh, re uh, street rehabilit rehabilitation in the second half of the year. So we would anticipate that going into construction um, in the late summer. 
Thank you. And can you also um, just really briefly talk about the outreach to Solano Avenue during, because there was construction on Solano, and I know in the past it's been a little um, bumpy, shall we say? Yeah, no, it no will be intended. a challenging project to implement, and however, however we do it. Um, We've been working hard with the contractor, um, giving, asking them for feedback essentially on what the best um, approach to the work would be. Um, so they've uh, recommended that we do extended hours during the day. Um, don't consider th something like uh, doing something um, overnight that just uh, logistically that really doesn't work and it doesn't benefit the city, it doesn't save any time. So we think we're going to be able to do this in four phases um, where we're going manhole to manhole, um, closing about a block at a time. And then outreaching to to the community, the business community, obviously, but also those residents who live um, on Solano and then also the streets adjacent to it, informing them early and often. So we've got a letter campaign that we're sending out now. Um, and as we get closer to a specific um, start date, we'll be communicating again and making sure they have a contact number and refreshing the website. We'll be using the e-news platform to uh, provide updates on the, on the schedule. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Does anyone in the audience want to pull an item from the consent calendar? I do have a, pub, a public comment card for 5-7. Oh, okay, please. Good evening, Council. Ed Fields. I trust you have all read the staff report and understand uh, staff's justification for this change order. I think the city's use of change orders to avoid competitive bidding needs to be questioned. Change orders are used when there's a change in scope of the original project, not to add this year's new project to the, contractor, to the contract for last year's project. This was done for sidewalk repair and is now proposed for a sewer rehabilitation project in excess of $3 million, a 100% increase over the original project. Competitive bidding is complex and time-consuming, but should not be avoided merely because it is inconvenient. It provides for fairness to the bidding contractors and to the citizens and taxpayers of Albany. Contractors may not challenge the awarding of a sole source contract in a case like this because it might create a prejudice against them. That is why citizens should question it. Timing is no excuse. The city knows it must do sewer rehabilitation projects every year. There will always be insufficient time if you plan for a sole source contract rather than allowing time for competitive bidding. The staff report states that going out for competitive bids would not produce an advantage, a cost advantage. Yet the comparison chart provided shows only that bids in Berkeley are much higher than they are in Albany. The only other example from Oakland for very similar amounts and size of pipe bursting shows two bids with lower cost per lineal foot than the change order proposed here. There's also a question of impropriety in working with a contractor on an existing project to give them an advantage in bidding on a new contract, for example, the traffic management plans, and then using that advantage as a reason to avoid bidding out the contract at all and sole sourcing it with the contractor who now has a competitive advantage. Municipal Code Section 1320 provides for the alternative of sole sourcing a contract as is stated in the staff report. But Section 13-5C states, when a contract provides for an expenditure greater than $100,000, the purchasing agent may award the contract only after a formal bid process as set forth in this section. And of course, 1320 is the exceptions when it's not convenient, shall we say. And I also want to note that even contracts, as in the, as in the city code, says even contracts between $30,000 and $100,000 require written price quotations from at least three potential sources. And those are $100,000, not $3 million. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other members of the audience who would like to comment or uh, to pull another item from the consent calendar? All right, I will entertain a motion. 
Um, I would like to ask staff to, if they would care to comment on Mr. Field's comments. So we understand that this is a unusual change order and it's probably something we don't want to do year over year. I think um, we chose this route for a number of reasons that we outlined in the staff report. Some of them are, uh, we do have a contractor that's performing well. We did negotiate a price based on a bid price and we lined out the uh, cost, um, you know, they, they, they essentially held their bid prices from a year ago as, as a basis for this work and made additions for very specific areas. And that's, and that's really where we think we have a, what rep represents a market value um, um, uh, price of work. Um, we did reach out to our other uh, agencies that are doing very similar work and the issue people are having um, is there's a lot of work out there and um, there's, uh, uh, which means prices are going up and that's reflective in a lot of the bids. Um, the Oakland bids are low and that's a little bit surprising but that just shows you that not every project's the same so we, we are definitely on the lower end of, of uh, uh, the unit cost price. Um, and as far as where we are in the, 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 the sewer work, um, the, the real driver behind this is to meet our consent decree requirements. And so this, we submitted a, uh, essentially a catch-up plan to EPA showing how we're going to get caught up on our uh, sewer replacement. And, um, you know, this, this isn't because of a failure of planning, it's just we have a lot of work to do and it's complicated. And we think this is a, a good approach. Yeah, thank you. Um, I support the staff's uh, decision in this case. Uh, I, I, um, I recognize Mr. Field's concerns, and I think they're valid concerns. And as staff says, it's not something we want to do um, willy-nilly. It's something we want to do uh, very carefully. But given the, the fact that we're playing catch-up, given that we're a small city where it's even tougher to get good bids and good contractors sometimes, uh, given we have a good relationship with this contractor, given that we've had some contractors who we have not had good relationships with, I think it, and given all the other, um, um, all the other arguments outlined in the staff report, I, I, I'll support the staff at this time and I will move the consent calendar as well. I'll second. With the city clerk. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Council Member Barnes? Yes. Council Member Moss? Yes. Council Member Pelch? Yes. Vice Mayor McQuay? Yes. Mayor Nason? Yes. We move on to good of the city. Um, good of the city is a time for persons desiring to address the city council on an item that is not on the agenda. Please note that city policy limits each speaker to three minutes. The Brown Act limits the council's ability to take and or discuss items that are not on the agenda. Therefore, such items are normally referred to staff for comment or to a future agenda. Do we have any speaker cards for good of the city? Okay, then we will move on to council member reports on meetings attended and announcement of future meetings um, and then uh, the, uh, the staff report. Does anyone want to speak? We have um, written staff, written uh, reports. Um, Vice Mayor McQuaid, do you want to speak on Alta Bates? Um, not particularly. I think the written report is sufficient. Okay. Um, with regard to the San Pablo Avenue Corridor Project Subcommittee, I should highlight that um, the recommendation is to create a subcommittee consisting of myself and Council Member Pilch uh, to look into our, um, as, and I should say, uh, I am the city's representative on the Alameda County Transportation uh, commi um, Commission and Council Member Pilch is the alternate. So the idea is that we would work together on the uh, outreach component of the San Pablo Avenue uh, corridor. And then um, my own meetings attended, I've got, um, I, I suggest people look at it online if you want to look at uh, links to the various meetings and things. I guess the one thing I would highlight in addition is that we did go ahead with the Albany Beach cleanup on Sunday. We had about 70 people 
uh, out there doing, and uh, people did a really good job, and I do encourage people uh, to get out to the beach. Do we need a motion for the subcommittee to establish the subcommittee? I think to establish the subcommittee, we do need a motion. I'll move we establish a subcommittee consisting of Mayor Nason and Councilmember Pilch um, to further public engagement in Albany and interjurisdictional communication regarding San Pablo Avenue corridor of the ACTC. I'll second that. Councilmember Barnes? Yes. Councilmember Moss? Yes. Councilmember Pelch? Yes. Vice Mayor McQuay? Yes. Mayor Nason? Yes. Uh, and we move on. Is there a staff report? Oh, excuse me. We have other council members who've been very busy. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're it's right. Does anybody want to report orally on meetings that they've attended? You want to go first? Uh, yeah, just yeah, it'd be really brief. Um, I believe there was a mixer at Britt Marie's, a chamber mixer at Britt Marie's. I think uh, all of us might have been there at one point. Um, mm -hmm. And I just want to note that the next EBCE meeting is tomorrow. Uh, I looked at the agenda, and there's a calendar of future meetings. We are. Um, uh, we have we have monthly meetings, and also we are we're, we're actually scheduled out every about every two weeks, and we cancel th uh, the meeting in between if we don't need to meet. But it looks like due to all the cons all the action happening with the PG&E bankruptcy and PCIA and everything, it looks like we'll be meeting about every two weeks uh, uh, through the spring, and um, that's it for me. Thank you. Uh, perhaps the only thing I could report on is I attended a, a spur presentation on uh, some of the projects that have resulted in uh, AB 2923, the uh, state um, uh, resolution that's uh, encouraging development on BART parking lots. Um, uh, lots going on. Uh, Lake Merritt parking lot um, had a presentation, West Oakland and the Bay Fair BART station. They're all well ahead of what's going on in Berkeley at North Berkeley, and I, I don't know that I've heard of anything happening yet at El Cerrito, but um, uh, uh, it looks like, hmm? We already have a TOD at El Cerrito. We have what? Transit-oriented development at El Well, we, we have some, but you know, take, this is specifically on parking lots. So at, say, Del Norte parking lot, I don't know that there's uh, anything that's taking over. Uh, there's going to be very little parking, I think, in the future at BART stations. Um, Thank you. Sure. Council Member Barnes, do you have a report? Yeah, I just want to mention briefly, I was invited to a monthly meeting, I think it was of the Hate neighborhood group. They were concerned about both SB 50, which is the reincarnation of SB 827, uh, Senator Scott Wiener's bill on um, more density around uh, transit. And then there was a, a person who spoke about that. And given I've now sat through several presentations from MTC staff about CASA, I spoke about CASA, the official position, and my perspective on it. But I stressed that I was just speaking as one person. But it was. It was kind of like, you know, being a, an alien from the East Bay going to San Francisco and giving them the perspective on the planet from the other side of the bay. But it was, it was very useful and interesting. You know, I, I had wondered why um, Yimby Twitter tends to equate Albany with Los Altos Hills, and now I, now I understand. Um, I did this a few days ago. <laughs> uh, all right. Any, um, do we have a staff uh, Excuse me. Thank you. I haven't done mine yet. Oh, oh, I thought you'd done. I thought you were done. Okay. No, I haven't started. Right. Go right ahead. Um, I was lucky to be able to attend a two-day juvenile justice forum uh, with uh, Chief Geisberger that was hosted by DA Dancy O'Malley. I went to the chamber mixer, the pancake breakfast, the Lunar New Year celebration. Uh, the mayor and I attended the UC Chancellor's Leadership Breakfast last week. Um, I represented us at the mayor's conference. We had a coffee with the cops. And I was also lucky enough to attend the, um, the Y Youth and Government VIP Day last Friday in Sacramento. And I also want to give a shout out to Albany High School wrestlers. The girls won North Coast Section Team Champion and West Al Alameda County Conference League Champion. And the boys won Tri-County Athletic League champion. Now you can do that. 
Okay, okay. <laughs> now, uh, do we have a staff report? Uh, yes. So uh, I'd like to recognize the Public Works crew for all their work during the rainstorms of the past week. Uh, the city fared well. Uh, flooding was limited to known tr trouble spots and no trees were lost, uh, just minor branches. Uh, landscape work at the Albany Loop art installation uh, will begin uh, as begun. Uh, depending on weather, uh, the project should be completed by the first week in March. Uh, the draft Solano complete, complete Streets Plan public comment period has started. The draft plan is available on the city's website. Comments uh, should be sent uh, by March 11th uh, to Anne Hirsch, the city's planning and building manager. A shelter management class taught by the American Red Cross is happen happening this Saturday at the, se the Senior Center from 9 to 5, and spaces are still available. Uh, you can contact our Neighborhood Services Manager for registration information. And finally, we have uh, four new staff members. Uh, please join me in welcoming in the Finance Department, uh, Nicholas Gresh, who is our new finance Financial Analyst, and Nancy Mar Marsh. Uh, who is our new accounts receivable technician. Thomas Peters is a new fire inspector, and Andrea Gilmore joined the recreation department um, as a program leader three. That's all I have. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, uh, tonight we have no presentation, no public hearing, and no unfinished business, so we will move on to new business. And uh, may we have a staff report, please? Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I'd like to give you a brief overview. Um, this is a study session on a seismic safety soft story retrofit program. Uh, this is something that has been identified in the past, first with your um, City Council strategic plan as something that you wanted to see brought forward to you. Um, to uh, address uh, potential seismic safety hazards for some of our rental housing. It was also identified in our local hazard mitigation plan, which was approved about a year and a half ago. Um, to begin with, just to give you some context and background, um, first of all, um, people are sometimes surprised to learn that um, building codes are not retroactive. So. Um, uh, today's building codes apply to today's construction. They don't apply to existing buildings. It's kind of like a, an old car doesn't get new airbags. Um, so a lot of um, our buildings, because we have an older building stock, a lot of our buildings don't meet or are nowhere close to modern seismic safety standards. Um, a series of earthquakes over the last decades have contributed a great deal towards the science of seismic safety. Um, beginning in particular in 1971 with the San Fernando Valley earthquake in Southern California, that led to um, the adoption of the first real meaningful seismic safety building code in California in 1973. And that's a really important um, milestone in, in building safeties. Most of the buildings bef built before the early 1970s were not engineered for seismic loads. They were engineered for the load that they would normally have on a day-to-day -day basis. Since then, there have been, um, unfortunately, a series, but predictably, <laughs> a series of earthquakes that have all contributed to our knowledge of seismic safety, um, including the Loma Prieta earthquake here in the Bay Area, the 1993 Northridge earthquake, um, and the Kobe, Japan earthquake in 1995, many others, but some of the, these are some of the major ones in terms of, of the evolution of, of building codes. So the buildings that are constructed today um, are significantly better than the, the older buildings. And it continues to evolve. You'll have an opportunity to adopt new building codes again at the end of this calendar year and become effective um, in 2020. Um, there are a wide range of earthquake-related risks. Um, this evening's presentation is primarily focused on one of them, but I just want to kind of acknowledge that there are a lot of other risks. And, and also acknowledge, first of all, that there are um, some buildings that are expected to perform pretty well. And in particular, our single family housing stock, in large part, if it's a new building or if it's been retrofitted and is on a level lot, um, it's, I think, considered one of the safest buildings in, to be in in an earthquake. So uh, for people who have retrofitted or are thinking about doing it, that's a really important first step to do. Um, and and with, with modern retrofit technologies um, should do well. Um, 
older buildings um, have a variety of risks to them. First of all, this, the first bullet point listed here, the multi-story wood frame building, that's the soft stories that we're talking about this evening, where there are large openings in the ground floor, typically a parking space. Sometimes it's a commercial space with a large uh, window um, are, are recognized as being at risk. Um, there are also unreinforced masonry buildings. These are buildings that have um, either structurally supported by brick or have a brick veneer or a brick parapet. There was, or there has been in, in the 1990s a, a retrofit program mandated statewide to identify these buildings. At the time, the city of Albany went through that. I believe we had uh, 41 of buildings identified and 33 of those buildings went through a, a permitting process in the 1990s and early 2000s. Some of the other buildings... Jeff, what does that mean, went through a permitting process? Does it mean they got fixed? Um, I haven't been able to confirm that all the construction was completed, but presumably if they began the... Pro what I can see from our, our records that we have readily available, um, that they, they started the process. I presume that they completed the retrofit process. Um, but we, we haven't gone back to check these records, which unfortunately aren't the clearest records in the world. I think really the way to do it is go back and re-inspect all these buildings to, to be able to give you a high quality assurance of what has happened with those. Um, there are other types of building risks um, that are less likely to be an issue in Albany just because there are not a lot of them. Um, in buildings built in the 50s and 60s had a concrete frame. To, to, there were some, um, I don't have the images with me, but in, in the Southern California earthquakes, some of these buildings have collapsed very dramatically. They tend to have uh, very stiff and they don't have enough rebar in the structure and they would collapse catastrophically. Um, and um, also in the Southern California earthquakes, particularly the Northridge earthquake, there were some steel frame buildings that in the course of the earthquake, kind of the welds cracked a little bit. Um, it's hard to identify those after an earthquake. The, um, the current non-earthquake example of a cracked weld is the Trans Bay Center in, in San Francisco, which was identified only because somebody was in the, the, the uh, working somewhere in, above the ceiling and, and noticed the, the uh, cracks in the, in the steel frame. Um, and again, that's something that was more prevalent in the 70s and 80s um, once the awareness became that that was a risk. Inspection protocols have improved pretty dramatically on welded steel frame buildings. Um, older industrial tilt-up concrete buildings also, the older ones tend to, to the, the walls would kind of just fold off. Uh, they didn't have a good connection between the, the wall and the roof. Um, finally, uh, the last two, um, the irregularly shaped buildings, if you have, like, say, an L-shaped building or a U-shaped building, sometimes different parts of that building will react differently to the same earthquake. And so they'll, they'll knock against, kind of almost physically knock against each other. Different parts of the building will knock against each other and can have some, some significant damage. And then finally, here in Albany, we do have a few homes that are on the downside side, downhill side of hillside parcels. Um, these are particularly vulnerable because they have a fairly limited area that's attached to good solid foundation. It's, it's usually the area right the, uh, fronting the street. And um, again, in the Southern California earthquakes, there were some, some uh, uh, failures of the structure of some of those types of homes. And then with any type of building, brand new to old, um, what's inside can cause a lot of damage and injuries. Um, and, sometimes, and also sometimes there are over, things overlooked like chimneys and fireplaces. Um, I believe in the Napa earthquake a few years ago there was a tragedy because of a, fire, a, a chimney collapsed through a roof. Um, and then um, decks are another area where construction uh, attention historically was pretty low. It was just something that was kind of slapped on this side of the building at the end and, and these days we're a lot more attentive to the engineering of those, of those, that construction. Um, so that was just an overview of the whole spectrum of, of building-related risks. Um, as I mentioned, we're kind of focusing uh, the presentation uh, this evening on soft story-related construction. Um, the image on the screen gives you an example of what those might look like. Uh, we have quite a few of them in, in Albany, and they're all over the Bay Area. They tend to be rental housing. They tend to be moderately priced rental housing for the most part. 
And it's that bottom story that is, it is the, um, the area of greatest concern. Um, this next image shows you kind of roughly what happens during the course of an earthquake, um, that the, the living areas have a lot of interior walls and they actually hold together pretty well. Um, it's the bottom floor that tends to collapse. In some of the attachments, there are some very dramatic photographs of, of catastrophic failures of buildings um, in San Francisco and in Northridge. Um, this is an image of, of something that's not quite ca as catastrophic, but is, is equally a, an impact on the people who live there. I think this is a six or seven unit um, building in Southern California, and as you can see, it's not, it's not safe for occupancy anymore, even though I'm sure everyone were able, were able to walk away from this without. Jeff, in Albany, were the soft story buildings that you were mentioning on the previous slide confined to a certain window I mean, you had said 50s and 60s. Did they extend into the 70s or 80s? Are we still building them? Um, beginning in the 70s and 80s, the codes became more stringent. I can't think of off the top of my head whether there were, might have been some that were built in the 70s or 80s. But by the 1980s, the codes would improve to the point where we're less concerned about it. We can check our records and do a, a search to, call, to find out. Um, my, my sense is that most of them were built after World War II, um, along um, uh, Keynes and Adams Street, par running parallel to San Pablo Avenue, a few maybe on San Pablo Avenue, a few on, Sol on Solano Avenue, then also a few in the, the Brighton area, kind of North Albany neighborhood. Um, and anything built before the, the, the mid-1970s would be probably vulnerable, like, like the building shown. So um, in your staff report, I give you some examples from nearby cities of, of Berkeley, Oakland, and Alameda. Um, I gave those particular, oh, there are other cities that are starting to roll this type of program out. I gave those three examples because they're <coughs> nearby. And to the degree that it's practical and it's the direction council wants to go, it's nice to have a program that's similar to our neighbors, just to help explain it to people. Um, we'll be dealing with many of the same engineers and contractors and just makes it a little bit more seamless. Um, the basic program is more or less the same approach. The first is to adopt a code standard. It's not automatically incorporated in the California Building Code, although there are reference um, standards that um, most agencies are using, so we would probably use those same standards as Berkeley and Alameda and Oakland. <clears throat> um, we would do a preliminary survey just based on visually what we can see from the street. And it's, it's not difficult in most cases to see that there's probably a hazard. Um, there is a methodology that's been developed by FEMA that we would probably use. It's a two-page checklist, got an example of that uh, on this uh, on a upcoming slide, that we would use to score the, the um, potential risks associated with the building. And we would set some threshold, and, and if it's above or below whatever threshold we want, we want to set, we would then require the property owner to hire an engineer to do a more formal assessment um, and submit that sub, uh, evaluation to the city. Um, and then based on the engineer's determination, if the engineer determines that it's hazardous, we could um, with council approval of an ordinance, require a notice be posted at the main entrance that says essentially, and um, you know, this is a potentially hazardous building and puts people on notice. Um, Alameda's program stops right there. Oakland and Berkeley go on to require retrofit with a, within a certain number of years. Um, there are um, the normal due process appeal rights that go with this and also um, we would want to have some flexibility so that if we have a unique situation with a particular building, um, we, can, um, we can work with a property owner to find the, the safest feasible solution uh, if, if necessary to, to, meeting, uh, to improving the safety for the occupants. <clears throat> um, this is, I know you can't read this, but this just kind of gives you the level of detail that would go into a drive-by um, or, or a sidewalk, I shouldn't say not, it's not a drive-by, we certainly get out of it um, and, and evaluate the building as best we can from the sidewalk, but it goes into quite a bit of detail in the types of, of um, 
information that goes into the preliminary scoring. <clears throat> Next, um, excuse me for a second. I'd like to give you just a rough idea what might be involved in a retrofit. Um, these are images that are taken out of a um, company called Simpson. They do a lot. They produce a lot of the um, materials and equipment that goes into retrofit projects. And this is just a clean um, graphic to help show you. It's not an endorsement of their particular products, but I, their graphics are good and clean. So I was going to use this as, as an example. This is an unretrofitted soft story building from the inside, to say, inside of a garage. And then this is um, some of the different technologies that are available to retrofit. And I'll kind of toggle back and forth here a little bit. Um, to begin with, the most obvious thing is the, the large metal frame around the garage door. Um, and that's a, that's a steel frame. It's anchored um, to, the, it, uh, to the foundation where a, a new footing is created as part of that. And then um, there, it's kind of hard to see on the image, but there are all sorts of fasteners and tie downs that hold this and attach this frame to the building itself. So what it does is, is really reinforce that opening and it doesn't allow that opening to twist around during an earthquake. Another approach is over here on the side. Um, this is um, essentially a structural piece of structural plywood that is nailed to the side of the building, interior side of the building, and there's a very precise um, nailing schedule and again, hold downs and um, anchor bolts and so forth that go, are associated with that. And it can significantly strengthen the wall and keep it from twisting and, and collapsing. And then another thing that is done sometimes when there's not a lot of room, and this is, is, is there are various products. This one is by Simpsons called a strong wall. It's a narrower um, uh, piece of, uh, uh, as you call it, material, but it's, it's a very strong, narrow wall that is a substitute or for something like plywood when you don't have enough room to, to create the strength in the, in the wall. And um, the, again, this has various tie downs at the bottom and the top and can fit into tight, generally pretty tight spaces if necessary. And what we would expect to see in a retrofit is some combination of these three things or four things if you include all the tie downs and, and anchor bolts and connections and so forth that would go into a retrofit. Uh, and it, you know, it doesn't usually try to go all the way around the building. Not every single wall, every inch of every wall needs to be retrofitted, but at least get all the sides of the building. And um, the engineers would, uh, the engineer record would design it and then we would have a consulting engineer review that for compliance. It's pretty standard engineering for the most part. It's not, it's not um, for, for the for engineers, it's pretty straightforward work. Um, there are policy issues that you should take into consideration as, as you think about this and give us direction. Um, first, there is expense to, to doing these retrofits and um, the one of the documents I gave you as an attachment was a research by the Association of Bay Area Governments. They estimate a retrofit at around $50,000. I think in today's um, construction environment, that's probably pretty low. Um, it's not a bad idea maybe to double that. Um, hopefully things will get better, but I, right now it's, it's pretty expensive out there. Um, and that can lead to an increase in rental rates if, if, if property owners are trying to cover their costs. Um, so one thing that we do have available to help with these issues of rent increases is a rent review program. Of course, we would prefer that property owners and tenants just talk about um, communicate directly with one another, but we do have that as an alternative venue. Um, another thing that is likely to happen um, in many cases will be a loss of parking. If you going back up to those images of the retrofit, sometimes these, these uh, retrofit solutions take extra space, and these parking spaces can be already pretty tight. Um, so it's not unusual to see a loss of parking. And um, I think to our recommendation would be to allow some flexibility to allow the reduction of parking spaces if that's what's necessary to get room to properly retrofit the building. Um, in addition, um, as, as you might imagine, there would be at the very least inconvenience for, prop, for residents and the tenants during construction, and, and hopefully not, but in some cases, residents might need to be temporarily displaced. 
Um, and then finally, just to, to point out again that while this is probably the single best thing and most important thing to do, it's not the only thing, and there are a lot of other things that can happen in an earthquake that can cause injuries or make a, a building uninhabitable for a period of time. And um, we don't want to lose track. This isn't the only solution. It's probably maybe the first thing to do, but there are other things to take into consideration as well. Um, at this point, I'd be happy to answer any questions and um, look forward to your direction on how to proceed. Are there questions from the council? Uh, sure, just one. Um, you said that you would do a preliminary survey, um, you, but uh, you've already done a survey and the results are in our packet. Why would you do another one? That was done by um, volunteers with the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute. Um, and I think one of them is here this evening. Um, and while I think everybody involved with that was, uh, most people involved were tra uh, trained and licensed architects or engineers or other professional qualifications. Um, because this is, it's now been about four years, I think, since that survey was done. And um, I'd wanna have a more consistent methodology um, to make sure that um, we're treating every building the same. This was a group of maybe 10 or 15 or 15 different teams of people who are doing it. And also some of these buildings may have been retrofitted since then. We get a few of these that have been retrofitted. Uh, so we'd want to just do a modern and more thorough survey. Okay, thanks. That's it for me. Vice Mayor McQuaid. Um, I think I'm okay for now. Um, uh, Council Member Moss. Sure. Um, I have lots of questions, but you know, I'll, I'll try to limit it at the moment. But uh, what are some of the costs of these things, like this preliminary survey? Do you have any kind of ballpark figure you can throw out of uh, what that might cost to look at? But we're guessing there's approximately 75 buildings that are soft story. And um, I, I mean, an idea per, per building or? I would expect each building would take probably 30 minutes to do an evaluation um, to, to fill out that form I showed you, and then probably another 30 minutes back in the office getting it organized and documented and into a database. So, um, you know, it's kind of, say we look at a couple hundred buildings, um, that, that could add up um, yeah. in the, into the tens of thousands of dollars. Um. I mean, there'd be the cost for that. There'd be the cost of um, uh, all the rest of the procedures of, of the processing of, of uh, uh, permits and, uh, and then looking at engineer reports and et cetera, et cetera. So this could be a, a fairly large expenditure, um, ultimately. I, I think you're right. Um, with respect to the permit costs, we would strive to, as we do today, charge a fee that's appropriate to recover our costs. Right. Um, Could that fee cover the, the visual inspections too? Of, I mean, the earlier inspections? I mean, would there be a way to neutralize the, the costs to some degree? To, to say, retroactively, I said we could, we could charge a fee to cover the whole the entire program cost, if you will. So it's kind of the overhead, consider that preliminary survey overhead mm -hmm. perhaps, and, and cover that entire cost. That's a possibility, yes. Okay. Um, I, th uh, I have other comments and questions, but I, I'll stop at this point. And Okay, I've got about five or six. Um, I guess I'm a little puzzled because we often get updates to various energy, fire codes, et cetera, from the state, and we just, you know, write them into our ordinances without questions asked, without tweaking them, without arguing against them. So this doesn't seem to be the procedure here. So, I mean, what does the state do? Surely the state has a lot of oversight of earthquake standards for the whole state, and we just don't automatically accept them like we do fire changes? Um, the, the state doesn't. Um, there's a lot of research into seismic safety, but you're required essentially to adopt the California Building Code as, as written. You can make local modifications, and I think we do for the fire department on a couple of things. Uh, but for the most part, we adopt the code as written. 
and um, which is which is the requirement under state law for new and it, but it only applies to new construction. So it doesn't require us to go back to an older building and require that building to be retrofitted. There are no state laws that require that. For fire, earthquake, energy, anything. Uh, that's correct. Hmm. You could, if you built a house in 1920, and there are a few of them out there, you can build a house in 1928, and they've never gotten a building permit. Believe it or not, they are perfectly legal. And they can have no insulation. They can have crummy old electrical meters and gas meters, and it's perfectly fine. Well, mine's been fixed up a little bit, but that's good to know. Um, let's say an owner is proactively concerned about this and just wants to get ahead of the game and hire a structural engineer and get a report. So there's two questions. One is, what's the ballpark? What would that cost? And then two, is there some standard procedure so that the building owner could be assured that the city would accept that report and not have to pay to do it over again because they were, it didn't meet some standards. I just um, want to, you know, if, I'm sure there's very conscientious building owners and they would like to jump on this if they can. Yeah, there, ha there have been a few retrofits, um, not as many as you'd probably want to have, but um, it goes through our normal process. I would guess that permit fee is is a few thousand dollars. Um, most of that goes to covering, either it goes to covering the cost of our outside consultant that does need to review the plans. Every every building design is a little bit different and there's a, a, a individual calculation for every project, for calculations. So there's not an over-the-counter, oh, it's there, check the box, you're done kind of process. It, it needs to be evaluated. Um, and then there, the other part of the fee essentially covers uh, the staff costs of our permit technician and our building inspector. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing, I haven't looked at one recently, but I'm going to guess it's a few thousand dollars for a normal, pretty simple, straightforward retrofit project for a multifamily like this. Um, mm -hmm. I should point out that for single family retrofit projects, uh, it's been long standing council policy that we waive that fee. So that's a free building permit for a single family retrofit. Mm -hmm. So the $2,000 or so is, is just to sort of spec out the, the scope of the project that's not to actually start doing any construction? No, that's the whole thing. That's the, if, oh, if someone just wants to spec out and talk to our consulting engineer, there's no cost to that. They're free to call them up or email anytime and they can have a back and forth. And that happens pretty frequently. But, and then does the city sort of rubber stamp, not rubber stamp, does, does the city accept that for some? We, the, the, our consultant is representing the city, so if our consultant uh, recommends approval, then we go ahead and process that. Okay, um, in, okay. In that's good, thanks. Um, it, just because you raised a red flag, I want to make sure, we all know historically in big earthquakes, gas lines break and fires happen, like in the, the big conflagration in 1906 in San Francisco. So presumably these ancillary risks that you mentioned have been dealt with in, with our, in our hazard mitigation plan? We're they're, I think they're, in a general way, cataloged in the hazard mitigation plan. Um, I'm not sure that it goes into the precise detail of all the elements of a, of a structure that might fail. Um, but I'm not thinking about, you know, books falling off the high bookshelf above your bed and hitting you on your head when you sleep. But people, apparently that's a big problem. But more like breaking gas lines or you know breaking water lines that kind of stuff i can't remember if, if gas line gas um automatic shutter valves were identified in the hazard mitigation plan or not specifically but that's something that we could begin to require okay um and this is i don't mean to sound cynical here but there, there's a downside of us not doing anything i mean there's some liability risk to us isn't there if, We've had this meeting. We know there's risks in our buildings. An earthquake happens, and people are injured, and buildings fall down. And do we get sued? No, not really. I mean, the, the city has. Uh, I'm not speaking to moral responsibility. I'm just legal liability. The city has liability for buildings that we own and control, but not for private, uh, privately owned buildings. And we don't have a affirmative legal obligation to force private owners to bring their. Um, uh, properties into a safe condition. We have the option to do that through this type of program or through 
ordinary code enforcement efforts, but not a legal liability if it doesn't happen. Okay, so for example, in the 19, I just got here, the 1999 earthquake, the Loma Prieta earthquake, um, there were not f lawsuits flying back and forth between the cities and various? Uh, not that I heard of, no. Mm. Okay. Um, but, but I think in general, retrofitting is cheaper than rebuilding, right? Yes? It's cheaper and um, perhaps more importantly, it's, it's really critical to keep the community together. If, if a couple hundred units of housing get wiped out, that's going to have an effect in, in a lot of different ways. Some of it hard to predict, but certainly our school district, um, some of our other community institutions where people participate in, our businesses where they shop in, mm -hmm. it will be a big deal. And is there, okay, last question. We have had some county money, and there has been an earthquake retrofitting program. I believe it's at the county level. And, uh, you know, they've been flyers, and people can call up numbers and, you know, get their cripple walls reinforced, et cetera. Is there any state or county money or programs available for, for these soft story buildings? Um, so I think the program you're referring to is the Brace and Bolt, and that's actually Correct. a state program. It's a state uh, seismic safety. Can you remember? Is it safe? Uh, California Earthquake Authority. Sorry, California Earthquake Authority program. Um, in Berkeley, they were successful in getting a very large grant from FEMA and the California Office of Emergency Services and the millions of dollars to help um, landlords with the permitting and, and construction costs. Um, we can't guarantee that you there would be a similar kind of grant for Albany, but we could certainly pursue that if if it was something that you wanted to go, uh, wanted more information about. Okay, fine, thanks. Um, I have a question. I was a little bit surprised by this, the number 75 uh, for multifamily structures uh, with soft story characteristics. And I'm wondering, can we get more of a breakdown on that? I mean, I'm, I'm wondering, I, from the, the size of that number, I'm assuming uh, that that must include things like side-by-side -side duplexes that have garages. We have quite a few of those. Uh, but if we would we be able to get some specification of the size of the different buildings um, involved? Because most of the, the retrofit ordinances are for buildings with four or more Units. I don't know if we have ones in the mix that are below that, but if also it would be helpful to know if there are large complexes uh, that are thought to uh, potentially need retrofitting. It would also, if this kind of analysis was done at all, it would be very helpful to know if there are ones that are viewed as really um, more dangerous to, to the occupants in an earthquake as opposed to becoming unusable as a result of the earthquake. You know, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of how we prioritize what we do. Um, to, in answer to your first question, um, yes, we have that information and we can, I can provide a, a more detailed breakdown of, uh, we have a by address and, and, and assessor's parcel right. number if necessary. And then with respect to your, your second comment, I agree, you, um, it would probably um, be most important to, to identify life safety. Um, and, um, and then whether the, you know, the livability, habitability of a, of a unit afterwards would be secondary. Um, but both are very important. Um, that, and that, yeah. that's building resilience needs a, it's not just getting people out of the building, but keeping the building occupied and keeping the community together. Yeah, okay. I was going to make a comment uh, just it related to something that Council Member Barnes was asking, and that was that there, there was a bill uh, that passed through the legislature but was vetoed that would have required local public safety officials to inventory uh, the, the buildings potentially at risk. And with a new governor, we may well see that move through the legislature again and be signed this time. I have sort of a, a procedure question. What, what, do, what, what do you need from us tonight? 
Um, some, you know, I, your, your initial reaction, excuse me, initial reaction to, to what a program might look like. Um, I'm pretty confident that all of you will be concerned about the risks that this, and this uh, situation has to the community. And if you wanted more background information, um, that we could, we could work on that, such as uh, Mary Nason wanting to get more details on the, on the information that we got out of the survey from a few years ago. Um, on the other hand, if you were convinced that this is something that needs to be dealt with and you wanted to dive right into some of the implementation details, the questions about how we deal with costs, um, incentives, um, some of the engineering issues, there are a lot of different places where you might have a particular interest. So if you could kind of nudge us in the right direction, um, that would be great. If you want us to do all that, that's fine too. It'll just take a little bit longer. Well, it seemed like there's like th three, according to the, th the materials we got, there were like three programs. The, the, just the evaluation, evaluation and retrofit fit with screening and then without screening, is that, did I understand that correctly? Um, I'm not sure about the without screening. There needs to be some way to evaluate whether or not a property would be um, subject to the requirements of the ordinance. There are different ways to do the screening, perhaps. Um, so is it your hope that we give you like one of those choices to start with? In, in reading all this, I, I sort of felt like, okay, where do we start? And that's kind of what I'm hoping that we're going to figure out tonight, but I don't know where to start starting it. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions from the council before we go to public comment? Right. I, yeah, I'd like to hear what the public has to say, and okay. I have plenty of ideas of where we can start, but let's hear what's going on out there. How many comment uh, cards do we have? I have two. Two, okay. Preston Jordan and Keith Knudsen. Okay. Good evening. Thank you for taking this up. It's very, very exciting. Um, I'm most excited by the fact I don't really hear any, any council members saying, well, this is, is something Albany should not do. Obviously, there's lots of nuts and bolts to figure out. The Association of Barrier Governments put out a projection of housing loss census tract by census tract last year. And it's obviously a very high level analysis, but if you add up the residential units that were projected to be lost in a particular event, which was a Hayward 7 magnitude event, which is not necessarily the most likely event, but not an impossible event, it's about one out of six residences in Albany were projected to be out of commission. And then another additional number of residences due to fire, which would bring the loss up to about one out of five to one out of four. So it's a pretty substantial existential threat. Um, if this inventory that's already been done, if all 500 of those units do in fact need retrofit, that would be a pretty big change in the risk to the city. Um, so I do hope you'll move forward with it. There are a variety of policy considerations, obviously, that have come up. Um, one that some cities have done is they don't have all the buildings subject to the same timeline. So they'll have buildings that say are over 15 units subject to a nearer timeline, buildings that are over five units or four units subject to a further out timeline. That can have a number of benefits. Um, one, it reduces the impact on uh, tenants for those buildings that are rented, so you're not taking a lot of buildings out of service all at once. Um, it can also phase in the effort for city staff. So if you structure it in a manner so that fewer buildings need to be retrofit up front, that gives a chance, opportunity for staff to develop capacity um, and learn and become more efficient uh, as well as a community. Um, so that, that's one thing I would ask you to consider and that's I think where Mayor Nason was headed to in asking for those kinds of details. We could come out of a more nuanced view of the inventory. And most of the cities I've seen that the standards they adopt or adopt are for retrofitting to life safety, not necessarily habitability afterwards. Um, some percentage of buildings that are retrofit to life safety will be habitable afterwards. I haven't found statistics on that. Um, so I think that's sort of an interesting question. What is the goal? And that's in the reading from ABAG that I did, that's one of the very important policy questions is what is the city's goal with these retrofits? 
So anyway, thanks very much, and I look forward to your deliberation. A uh, clarifying question. At the beginning of your, your remarks, you mentioned one in five or one in six residences. Does that equate with units? Yes, residential units. Yeah, so sing, single residences, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good evening. So my name is Keith Knudsen. Uh, my day job is with the U.S. Geological Survey. I help to run the West Coast uh, Earthquake Hazards Program for the USGS. I say that so that you know that I know a little bit about earthquakes. I'm not here re tonight representing the USGS. I'm here representing myself, just to be clear. I, um, I'm not wearing a USGS shirt or anything like that. Um, so we're about a half hour walk from the Hayward Fault. Just walk up the hill. Uh, not very far, and in geologic terms, we're right next door. Um, the Hayward Fault produces big earthquakes very often. It's forecasted based on what we know now about the Hayward Fault, that there's about a one in three chance it'll produce an earthquake in a 30-year period from 2014 to 2043. We calculate those odds over 30-year periods because that's the average tenure of a mortgage, relevant to what we're talking about tonight. Um, if we look at all the faults in the Bay Area, there's about a 72% chance that, that there will be a big earthquake in that 30-year period. So we will be shaken. These buildings we're talking about will be shaken during their lifetime. Um, it's not earthquakes that harm people, it's buildings in earthquakes that harm people. And there are several kinds of vulnerable buildings. Jeff talked about several of them. You already have programs to address most of them. It's soft story buildings that you don't have a program to address. So uh, I encourage you to, to uh, tackle this problem head on. Um, I was part of the EERI survey back in two 2013. There were definitely buildings that um, were more likely to survive an earthquake, the more recently built, and then there are older buildings, which probably are not likely to sur survive an earthquake. So this screening, um, the way that the process works, well, let me, let me go back to the EERI survey. Um, in the staff report, it mentions that there are about 75 of these buildings, about 500 units. That's somewhere between 5 and 10% of the population of Albany, if you assign uh, two or three people to each unit. That, this is a big potential problem. Um, the adjacent communities have all taken on this problem. El Cerrito is talking about this problem. There are example ordinances and, and, and uh, programs you can adopt. Um, ABAC has summarized those for you. The typical process is first an inventory, so you have a good running start at that from a ERI. And a lot of the adjacent communities have just used that inventory. Second, second is Every, every building that's on that inventory is asked to do an engineering assessment. These are old buildings. They need, they're in need of assessments. Third is some sort of mandatory retrofit program. That's how the, the adjacent communities are doing it. Some of them have a voluntary retrofit program, some have mandatory, but you need first the inventory, then the engineering assessment, and then the program you, you elect. So thank you, I hope you'll take this, this uh, issue seriously. Um, I have a question for you. Um, in the, of those 75 buildings, uh, uh, none of them were single family residents, I presume. They were all multifamily. Yeah, the, right. And um, what was the, the minimal size, a duplex, or, or was it three or more, or four or more units? So that, that's a choice you all can make. Yeah, How many I, I units know, were know, in the 75? I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't think we had a cutoff. We were, certainly weren't looking at duplexes. Um, do you, I don't... I, don't. I have the database, a detailed database. Um, I don't have it in off the top of my head. Uh, okay. what, it, what, you, what you saw sort of there were multifamily units. And whether that included maybe three or four unit buildings, I'd have to double check. Okay, well, I, I mean, I ask because if that didn't include du duplexes, I, I certainly know of a number of duplexes in this city that are soft story, but, you know, with garage under, so the problem could be much larger, uh, although, um, 
you know, how much larger, I'm not sh quite sure, but uh, than, than just saying 75 buildings in, in terms of the, or the number of, of uh, units that, that might be at risk. Yeah, uh, that inventory did not include duplexes. It included um, several unit buildings. Okay. Is my understanding. Right. Uh, may, I, may I answer a question? I forget, one of you brought up the liability question earlier. Yeah, so um, we're talking about existing buildings, not new buildings. The building code deals with new buildings. There are no, no requirements for people to go back and fix their existing buildings. They're old buildings that are in need of fixing. So is there liability that the city has? No. Is there a moral responsibility? Absolutely. Um, think, think about the, the consequences to the renters, to the neighbors, to the community. If five to, well, five to 10% of the population is residing in these vulnerable buildings. Okay, question, was there any data collect, you know, hypothetically $50,000 to retrofit a, a 10 unit building was, is that outrageous? Is that ballpark? Um, there have been studies, I, I'm not gonna give you a number off the top of my head, um, the, the, these, pro, these other neighboring jurisdictions, including San Francisco, have been collecting information about the costs, and so they can tell you on a per unit basis what the average cost is. I think it's on the order of a, f a few to several tens of thousands of dollars per unit, but um, we can get you a real number. Okay, that's good, that. but then, the, then of course the issue is given how high rents are now in the Bay Area. Is, and given how, you know, mom and pops are often pretty capital constrained, how would they pay for that without jacking up the rents through the roof? So this is a discussion that every community has. Um, and I have to admit, I, I think it's specious. Um, anyone who's owned one of these buildings for more than a few years has considerable equity in their buildings. The, the value of their buildings is increasing at a ridiculous rate, just like my house is. Um, so, so their buildings are, are worth a whole lot of money, and if it requires a loan, I think these buildings should be fixed. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And I'm, I'm happy to assist and recruit my friends to assist, if you'd like. <laughs> Thank you. That's what we wanted to hear. Mr. Outis? Yes. I'm sorry I didn't fill out one of these earlier, but... Um, I'm an Albany resident, and I'm a tenant in an apartment building, and I sleep over a garage, uh, two stories up. Uh, I am a tenant in an office building, and part of my office is over a parking area. I suspect I spend almost as much time in my office as I do in my residential apartment, and I hope that I mean, I think this is a great idea, and I think it should be taken very seriously. And I do encourage you to work on it, but I, uh, I think it's important that we not just think in terms of residential units, because there are real people who work in offices in soft story buildings, who have guests who come in, clients, other people who have reasons to be there. So I think that you really need to consider the commercial aspect of it. And I did actually have an experience with a building that was being retrofit in Berkeley a few months ago, and the landlord was very resistant to the changes that were required. Um, there was a commercial tenant downstairs that I happened to represent. And the city staff really took the position that, you know, it's about the people living upstairs, and the notice requirements applied only to giving notices to the residential tenants. The commercial tenants, were they were just kind of up a creek and the landlord could do what they want. So I think it's important to not limit the consideration to residential tenants. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other public comment? Seeing none, I will bring it back to the council for comment. Well, I'll say it, I mean, we spent two years working on a rent review process with some vociferous criticism from our landlord community in town. And I don't see that community very well represented here tonight. So I'm wondering 
what happened and if we need to reach out to them or is there going to be a wave of delayed feedback. But in general, I think we should proceed to get this problem fixed. With respect to the outreach to the landlord community, I did reach out to them last week, um, and I believe that some of them are at a competing meeting in El Cerrito this evening. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure what their issue is, but I'll, I'll keep them in the loop if, if we move forward. Um, yes, we definitely need to proceed. And um, as to the last point made, um, I think we should also be looking at some of our commercial buildings. I've, I've often wondered when the last time uh, the structure over the grandstands at Golden Gate Fields was ever looked at, um, given its age and what might happen in a big quake. God help the people that are sitting out there if that thing fell over. Um, I mean, there's, you know, there's a lot of information in the staff report, and and I could pick and choose what I think would be um, would work for all uh, for Albany. Um, I, you know, I think we definitely, you know, most cities were only looking at uh, buildings where five or more, or four or more units. I think we should expand it down to duplexes, um, and. Um, but you know the way to do it is probably to do that tier system where the the bigger the building, the older the building, the more likely it'll be in that first tier that we have to go after uh, initially. And then you know as you get smaller buildings or newer buildings, they can be in a in a third or fourth tier that might not get attention from the city for uh, some number of months. Um, as to the initial costs, I would hope there might be grant money that could actually be used to do that initial surveying um, um, and at least get the ball rolling in some way, um, either from FEMA or from the state or wherever you can pull grant money out of the, you know, uh, the grant money thing. Um, you know, a lot of the issues are going to be political. You know, uh, you know how how is this paid for by the commercial uh, uh, landlord? Um, I think uh, uh, you know some of these ideas that were uh, passed around in uh, Oakland had a system where um, the the cost could be amortized over 20 years, uh, or 70 percent of the cost could be amortized over 20 years. Um, I'm not sure what those magic numbers are at this point. I think you you need to talk to the to the property owners, uh, but uh, you know I I think if they could amortize it over most of that cost over a period of time, the effect on tenants would not be that great. Even at you know ten thousand dollars amortized over say 25 years, uh, you know I don't have my amortization book in front of me, but I don't think it, that's more than a few you know. Uh, I, I can see somebody who might be able to figure that out for you. If I may, I did that this afternoon uh, just to help you kind of give you a ballpark. So let's say it's an eight unit, I pick this particular, to make the math easy. If it's an eight unit project, let's say it costs $100,000, that trans and you, you finance that through a normal 15 year bank loan, which is around 5% right now, um, that roughly translates to about $100 per unit per month. Okay, and, and that might be pretty steep for some people. So I would say that perhaps we want to get um, a, a little more landlord um, um, uh, money in the game, and, and so they might have to carry that a while longer than, say, just 15 years. Um, but uh, that's strictly my opinion, and again, that's a very political, you know, question. You know, one, one question I, I had um, about any of these programs, and I don't know if you have this feedback, we're, we're mostly been talking about multi-unit um, buildings that are, have a landlord and their rental units. How about a multi-unit building that's all condos? Uh, have, has there been, have those kind of buildings been done? Um, are they any more difficult to do because you have that kind of? Yeah, for example, all of the 
condos on the north and eastern slope of Albany Hill that are built out over very steep terrain. And there's walkways. It's like, you know, almost like a tree house, a bunch of tree houses over there. I mean, they may have been built after the codes, but. After some of them, I think those are examples of, of the downhill, downhill side of hillside properties that are of concern. If nothing else, their decks, I know, are in some cases vulnerable. Um, so I, I, I would presume that we would do surveys for all the multifam or whatever criteria you set, whether no matter what um, the ownership model is, we would evaluate that structure. So if it's a if it's a five-unit condo or a five-unit apartment building, we would evaluate it the same way. Yeah, I would. I would hope you would look at all those buildings because I can also see, I can also think of an argument where well, they're all actually it's like a bunch of single-family residents all combined together. So maybe legally we don't have to look at them, or we can look at them individually. But I, I don't know. Some some of those buildings are quite large and 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 also quite old. Um, as you know, one of the questions was every city is using different retrofit standards, and there was, you know, I, I you know, one was a FEMA standard, one was a, a building code standard, uh, one was some kind of general in engineer standard. That's well above my pay grade, you know, and I and I think that's going to be up to staff and. Uh, you know, consulting engineers as to what works best. And, and again, that might be something that's part of that tier system. Um, you know, some buildings might have to have older stand, uh, you know, higher standards than other buildings. Um, but I, I'm not sure how that would break down. Um, and, then, and then finally, the, the last comment that I can see here quickly. Um, you know, soft story is the, the concentration on the report was soft story, but um, to the degree there may be other things that could cause uh, a lot of damage or death, uh, the unreinforced masonry, um, you know, uh, things hanging on the walls that could fall off. Um, uh, Etc. I, I would think that perhaps this is an opportunity to to include some of that into this whole system, and then rather than just have soft story um, be the the in the title, it would be just seismic safety. Um, so we could take care of a number of issues, um, and and the standard I I think really should be uh, habitability, not just you know people don't die, but that we retain, you know, um, uh, livable buildings as much as possible. Um, I guess there were other ideas. I, I mean, uh, you know, we could should be looking at tax credits for landlords, you know, if, we, if we're going to make them car carry the bill and then have to amortize it over a long period of time, perhaps we can give tax credits. I, I love that thing that there, I think, was in Oakland that allows, uh, once a building's been completed, you can add an extra unit um, or two units, depending upon the size. Um, um, I certainly wouldn't worry about losing parking. Hi, you know, height increases or setback increases, I think those are all things that are pretty minor if, if it's going to um, allow a building to keep standing after a big quake. Um, okay, I'm, I've said enough. I'll, I'll pass it on. Uh, Vice Mayor McQuaid, do you have any comments? Well, I think I agree with what other people have said that we need to, to start moving on this. Um, I like the idea of including all multifamily condos com and the commercial side. I think that's all great. Um, it seems like Oakland is the most is the most recent um, ordinance. They passed it, I believe, last November, December, whatever. So that's seems like that's probably one that we might want to look at simply because it was just done. Um, I like the tier system. You know, I understand that the owners are trying to amortize this and get their money all back, but. But I think that people have to understand that they still own the building and their value of that building has gone up. So I think that we need to be careful that the tenant doesn't bear the entire burden of this, that the, um, that the owner 
is having to pay at least a, you know, a portion of it. Certainly the tenant pays something, but I, I think it's important to remember that they still own the building and that building is valuable. Um, I like the idea of the total seismic safety with chimneys or gargoyles or whatever, that we're looking at all of that. Um, and I, I know years ago when I was still working for the school district, we spent a lot of time talking um, just in general in safety meetings about the URM. And Sorry, URM? Unreinforced masonry. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems like a lot of progress was made and maybe it's just sort of stopped. And I'd like us to look at that and figure out where we are and if if work was done, that's great. If it wasn't done, let's start pushing that forward since it sounds like we have an ordinance for that. We had a program and we shouldn't just let that go. And I think that's kind of it for now. Thank you. Council Member Pilch. Yes, by all means, let's strap down the gargoyles. I, I agree. <laughs> um, you know. I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. It's okay. Um, and, the, the, and the angels. <laughs> Uh, thank you to the members of the public who came tonight. Mr. Knudsen, I saw him do a presentation, I think for the CERT volunteers a few months ago. That was very informative. And, and to Mr. Jordan, who's been speaking out publicly about this for some time. Um, in, first, if any of my council members have, ha, who I believe all do own homes, have not retrofitted, uh, please do. Almost any contractor can do it for the typical scenarios. The te techniques are now well known and standardized and, and you don't need to pay a structural engineer. Um, I've overseen three retrofits of single family homes that myself or my family owns, of two of which are in Albany and I, I'm, I sleep much better at night uh, knowing those buildings are safer. Um, as I agree, I think I agree almost completely with what's been said previously. The only question I have is about the inventory. There might be some really good reasons why certain buildings are left out of that inventory. Duplexes, for example, and other buildings. Um, I'd, I'd certainly want to be inclusive as possible, but uh, we, we probably ought to see why, uh, study the reasons why other cities leave those buildings out of the inventory. If maybe there's good reasons we don't know about yet. Um, I think. I agree we should move forward. I think, uh, you know, the, one of the issues is going to be in our small city that uh, staffing this is going to be difficult. You know, we have a small staff. So I think uh, I'm imagining that the way to get this done would be through um, contracting it out or hiring some consultants um, and perhaps, uh, you know, getting extracting some, or, that's, that's not the right term to use, but um, having some program where the uh, owners of these buildings would, would pay into the program um, uh, or perhaps a, a fine for um, non-compliant um, building owners that would pay into the funding of this program. Um, uh, but I think that actually now would be a good time to get this program started. We are in, we are a little bit more flush than cash than in other years because of the good economy. So perhaps we could spend a little bit of the extra cash the city has for a program such as this because we might not have it in, in a year or two if the economy goes down. Um, other ideas, um, could we join with another, this, this is probably a non-starter, but could we join with another city uh, like El Cerrito or join Berkeley's program such that we got that um, uh, economy of scale somehow? Uh, that might be logistically too difficult, but uh, something to, to consider, at least it, it's worthwhile to ask that question, I believe. Um, I think at the very least we should proceed to the um, to the engineering assessment phase, that all these buildings should have that engineering, structural engineering assessment, and we should have that information on record. Um, if nothing else, some buildings might find out that they're okay and, and that they don't have to do further work, uh, but others will be informed uh, you know, as to just how difficult the problem is. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I think I, it looks like we're all agreed while well, the mayor is yet to speak, but. Um, uh, I'm guessing we're all agreed, and uh, but staff probably wants to figure out ways to do that, which um, are going to be um, are going to be doable by by the small staff. So, thanks. Thank you. Um, 
I want to say, first of all, uh, there was some discussion about the goals, and I, I agree with those who say that there should be a goal of uh, preserving our housing stock so that we don't have people um, out of their homes after um, an earthquake, if possible. But there should be an immediate goal of reducing uh, risk to uh, uh, of, of loss of life or bodily injury. That should be, if there are opportunities um, to, uh, or if there are situations that are particularly uh, perceived to be particularly dangerous, uh, we I think that we should uh, prioritize those and get on top of them as quickly as possible. Um, I wanted to point out that uh, a one of the things that I think has been discussed in connection with uh, climate issues is the conversion to electric from natural gas to electric. And this may be um, uh, an additional benefit of that conversion, perhaps even a primary benefit of that conversion, might be to reduce uh, the fire risk um, in older buildings, particularly if they uh, if they are retrofit uh, in that way. And I hope that we should. Uh, I hope we can look at if there's a way for some synergy between those two uh, those two improvements to our housing. Um, Finally, well, I, I want, I do want to get the survey information, both the uh, soft story information and the uh, uh, URM uh, information. In in this case, I, I don't always like to think that the council should dive into details, but in in this situation, um, I think it's going that kind of data is going to be really important for establishing priorities and understanding the magnitude of the whole uh, problem. And finally, I just say, I have to say this with regard to extra cash, I'm, I'm concerned. I mean, we saw a 50% reduction in our net position uh, over a two-year period, and we've got deteriorating infrastructure. I'm very reluctant to say, well, We've got a budget surplus. We can do it. Um, we have to. We we still need our need comprehensive uh, uh, financial reporting that is built into long-term financial planning to really understand uh, what our financial situation is. That being said, this is an extraordinarily high priority, especially the the threat, uh, the the short-term immediate. Uh, threat to, uh, to, 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 to the people living in these, uh, in these units to do whatever we can to minimize that as quickly as possible. Just so I understand, we're basically in a situation where we have carrots but no sticks and we're not sure how much the carrots are going to cost. Is that a Fair assessment. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by carrots and sticks. Well, we have no, we, we can't compel anyone to do any retrofitting on older buildings. That's what I think I heard tonight. Currently, that's correct. There's no regulation against having a soft story building. So we can't go and tell people to do anything. So we're going to have to nudge them. Well, you, could, you could if you wanted to. Um, and that's essentially what Berkeley and, and Oakland, as an example, have done. And I think, you know, if we make an argument that retrofitting is cheaper than rebuilding, and this is really in your personal self-interest as a business person, I think that will, that will go a long way. And I'll just say one more thing. Boy, many years ago, maybe in the early 90s, I was, and our friend, by the way, from the USGS, Mr. Knudsen, is that correct? You can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I was talking to earthquake engineers at UC Berkeley right after... I was hired there, and they said, you know, so far we've been really lucky, but if the big one came in the early 90s before they had retrofitted the EUC Berkeley campus, and they thought that the buildings would allow everyone to get out, but would be basically red tagged, they said it would not make financial sense to rebuild the campus in the same place. 
And so can you imagine an alternative world where UC Berkeley was not there anymore because we couldn't afford to rebuild it? So my point being is I think we've gotten lucky that we didn't have more earthquakes in the last, since 1989, that we haven't really had any big ones. And, you know, you're only lucky until you're not. So I think we might have a sense of complacency here just because we've been lucky. And we cannot assume, based what Mr. Newton told us, that we're going to be lucky like that again for the next 30 years. Is that fair, do you think? Uh, do you want to do you want to ask him a question? That's okay, but uh, well, I guess my so the question is: Have we been lucky for the last twenty years? Well, it's not a matter of if; it's when, right? And uh, so, to take your UC Berkeley um, story, we can relate it to Albany. The the vulnerable buildings in Albany are along the Commercial Rose, Solano, and San Pablo. Um, so if we have a big earthquake, that's where all the URMs are, that's where all the few concrete buildings are, that's where we're going to be hit worst. As, as Jeff said, the single family homes we think are probably going to do in general okay, but the city will be drastically impacted. So it really pays to work on these, these vulnerable buildings. If I if we go back in a time machine to 20 or 25 years ago and ask you do you think there'll be a big earthquake in the next 20, 20 or 20 or 25 years? Would you say the odds are pretty good? And then looking back retrospectively, have we sort of dodged a bullet so far, but maybe for not much longer? Well, I give lots of talks like the one you saw. And uh, when I talk to school children, I tell them that in their lifetime, they will be shaken hard. Thank you. Um, I'd like to clarify, I'd like to be sure that we're clear on, on one point, the, the discussion about carrots and sticks. What we're talking about here is essentially creating a stick that we don't have right now. And so we are talking about adopting an ordinance which would be mandatory, and there would be consequences to people who violate the ordinance. That's correct. That's a, my understanding of, the, of the, what the other cities have done in the direction that you've given tonight. And let's, Another way. So, uh, I, I would have a question. How long might it take to craft these ordinances that we're talking about? Because when, when I look at what the other cities have done and, and the um, uh, model ordinance that, that was in our packet, uh, they're pretty extensive and, and they're in a lot of different kind of areas, it, it, it seems. Um, and then when you take into consideration how is a landlord going to pay for it, what, what's his right in terms of raising rents or not raising rents, et cetera, et cetera, there's, there's a lot of moving parts uh, on all of this. Um, we're looking at a one-year timeline, a six-month timeline? Uh, I would expect at least six months. Six months. Um, I think that we'll um, uh, need to come back to you on a number of occasions. We'll need to do public engagement. Um, I've kind of reached the end of my professional capabilities here this evening, so I'd want to bring in people who have the engineering technical background on, on the details of the code requirements. Um, we have money in our budget under the budget that you've already approved to, to be able to do that, so it's not anything you have to act on. Um, and then, um, um, you know, working through all, you know, reaching out to all the stakeholders that would be affected. Um, do keep in mind that Berkeley and Oakland have rent control, so they have a different relationship with tenant landlord relationship than we would here. They, uh, and, the, and they have a system to kind of funnel this all through, and, and we don't have that. So uh, if we are going to, you know, make pass ordinances on about how this, how the cost can be passed on or not passed on to tenants, we're going to have to set up some way to, to, you know, get land uh, property owners to agree to it and then, and then monitor it. And, um, and it actually could be, have to be, you know, looked at over a long period of time, I would think. And we're hoping that the rent review process that you've already established would be the mechanism that we could use for some of that. Mm -hmm. Data collecting. Well, just if there, if there are issues, if, if we were to implement a program and, and there were some concerns by, about the, 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 the cost being passed on to, 
to tenants and there was a disagreement between a landlord and, and tenant on that, we do have the rent review program that's available to help resolve that. I'd, and I'd like to think that the tenants were also brought into the, the initial discussions as the landlords are, mm -hmm. whether they you know, choose to participate, but that, but that there's outreach to them, so it's not a surprise to them. If I may, I'm still, and maybe Craig needs to weigh in here, what, from a legal perspective, what is the ultimate source of our authority if we have no power to make old buildings get retrofitted? Well, I, think you do. I think you do have some power in that regard, but many, many cities have opted not to do it. I mean, the, the seismic uh, retrofit program that was implemented for uh, unreinforced masonry buildings is one example of just establishing a deadline for bringing the buildings up to current code. If the city were to determine that there is a current threat to the life safety of our residents due to a failure to seismically retrofit buildings, you could uh, implement ordinances to order those changes to be made. It, it's obviously not an easy thing to do because you're ordering people to spend a lot of money they don't want to spend. So what many cities have done as opposed to that is implementing them either over time as buildings are remodeled voluntarily that the uh, uh, requirement is to bring them up to current code or to have some uh, you know, longer term program of phasing in the changes. But I think if there, there would be authority, if you exercise your authority to the max to order uh, uh, retrofits to pr protect the public health and safety. This is would fall under the rubric of police powers that city governments have. Correct, correct. Yeah, I think it's, I think we need to think um, in terms of something simple, <laughs> because we are so small um, and not terribly wealthy, making it as simple as possible. You know, we can look at the, the Oakland ordinance, I think your point um, was that uh, that was the most recent one, but it appears to me that almost all of the cities that have done this have been large and rent controlled. And that's a very different situation than what we face. Uh, Sebastopol seems to be the only other small city that has done this. So we need to um, proceed in a way that is going to be workable and feasible for a city this size. Do you think it'll be possible to um, both do a survey? Um, I, I mean, you know, it'd be, I guess my preference to be able to at least begin that survey process to see what the situation really is um, and simultaneously be working on that other part of what of how we're going to respond to this and what ordinances need to be passed and and um, all the other you know, technical stuff we've we've talked about um, at the same time. And in other words, could we could we pass something, you know, fairly quickly that says yes, we are going to go out and survey all all multifamily or rental structures in in Albany, um, and get at least that point of information, and then take it from there. I think what uh, clearly what would be uh, I'm hearing from you this evening is that we should come back to you soon and glean as much information as we can out of the the EERI survey that was done a few years ago and give that to you and see if that's um, enough information. I think it's good information for decision making. I just wouldn't use it for a um, a 2019 code interpretation and and use it in a regulatory context, but in terms of a survey of the of the condition of properties in Albany, it may be enough um, or not. You could you'll tell us, but we can show you what we've got <coughs> if that's enough for you to feel comfortable with us proceeding. Or we we do go back and do a more thorough um, survey now and then bring back to you. Uh I, I mean, I'd be comfortable with that, but but if we were to um, proceed with um, you know some kind of enforcement thing or telling people, well, now you have to go get an engineer's report, would it wouldn't be enough to to, to start doing that, would it? No, I, I would feel more comfortable having a fresh um, 
assessment done of any of those buildings where we would begin an enforcement action and making sure that the person that's doing that assessment is qualified to do it and that they're doing it consistently throughout the city. Mm. It's nothing we, against the people who did the survey, but it was right. just a bunch of different people and some of them were architects, some of them were engineers, some of them were planners. Right. Could we give direction to, do, to start that now rather than wait for something else to happen? I'm not sure what we're waiting for since it seems like we all know that's the first step. Yeah, I don't want this to be held up by a grant application. It will take two or three years to bear fruit. I think the, the first step is looking at the information, taking a closer look at the information we have. And that we should be able to do almost immediately. Yeah, you can bring that back to us. And I want to point out that Mr. Knudsen did say that other cities have just used, I believe you said the other cities have just started with the ERI information and knocked on their own inventory. Um, but so let's see that information first. Maybe we can use that as the basis for starting and save ourselves some time and money. Okay. Clear as mud. It's a great start. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Um, we are uh, approaching. Uh, we are not quite approaching adjournment. We are at uh, other business, announcement of events, and future agenda items. Does anyone have? Uh, agenda items or uh, other business or announcements they'd like to make. Uh, don't forget to get your tickets to the Film Fest. Uh, I've got my um, season tickets or whatever they're called. The, um, and I would like to reiterate my request for a discussion of advisory body uh, formation and a request that we bring back to the council even before this closed session meeting an agenda item to decide whether or not as a council we want to make those final appointments. Anything else? Okay, um, then we are ready to uh, prepare to adjourn. We are adjourning tonight in memory of Gail Hines Shea. Gail exemplified much of what is best in the spirit of Albany. She grew up in a single parent family with four siblings, so she had to exercise a lot of hard work and determination to make the life that she wanted for herself and her family. Family was the center of her life. She and her husband Jeff were married for over 30 years and raised three boys here in Albany whom she treasured beyond words. She was deeply committed to the youth community of Albany, including Boy Scouts and Little League and other youth activities. Many who think of Gail primarily as a mom and a youth community contributor do not realize she had a career as a highly respected technical editor. Since retiring, she found joy in creating and sharing beauty through gardening and quilting and through travel. She read broadly and deeply and was always a joy to speak with. She and her beloved dog, Riley, were always a welcome sight in the neighborhood, and she will be deeply missed in Albany. Let's take a moment to remember. Oh, yes. And I want to add a few things. Um, I, I knew Gail before she and Jeff got married, and I've known Jeff since before we were in school. And I would say that Gail is, has always been one of the most generous people that I know. Her, her talent in fabric art and quilting was just amazing. And any time there was an event, any raffle, silent auction, whatever, Gail was on the phone, I'm going to bring you a quilt. It's going to be unique. It's going to be wonderful. And it always was. And she's truly going to be missed. And we're adjourned. Thank you.